Welcome to Green Building Matters, the original and most popular podcast focused on the green building movement. Your host is Charlie Cicchetti, one of the most credentialed experts in the green building industry and one of the few to be honored as a lead fellow. Each week, Charlie welcomes a green building professional from around the globe to share their war stories, career advice, and unique insight into how sustainability is shaping the built environment. So settle in, grab a fresh cup of coffee, and get ready to find out why green building matters. Hey everybody, welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. I love it. Once a week I get to interview a green building professional somewhere in the world and I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to Georgia Tech and I get to interview an awesome professor and author from Georgia Tech. So today I have Dan Matisoff here. He's the Director of Sustainable Energy and Environmental Management Program there at Georgia Tech. Dan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day. It is, man. We connected at the recent Green Build Conference out in San Francisco. We've got some ties here, obviously, through Georgia Tech, and I just can't wait to learn more about how you got into sustainability and green buildings. But I always ask my guests, you know, take us back. So where'd you grow up and go to school? Uh, So I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I went and did my undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania, where I majored in economics and took some public policy classes in international relations. And then I did my PhD at Indiana University, where I did my PhD in public policy with an emphasis in environmental policy. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, anything with that upbringing that maybe helped you have a focus on sustainability? Or was that a little later in your career? Like, did you have an aha moment about sustainability? Well, Well, my father was a geologist, so I can't rule that out as an impact on you know, thinking about the environment from a young age. I know he worked on the acid rain problem in in the 1980s and uh, the invasive zebra mussels in Lake Erie. So that definitely had an influence. But what really got me specifically into environmental economics was a class I took in undergrad. You know, climate change was recognized at the time. Kyoto had passed, but we had failed to ratify it. And I was trying to understand why. At the same time, I was learning about cap and trade as a market-based mechanism to address climate change. And that that got me excited. And so when I went to do my PhD, I was intent on working on climate change. I was intent on working on voluntary initiatives to address climate change. And so that, not, you know, not much longer later led me to programs, information-based programs, eco-certification programs like LEAD, and that's where I focused the majority of my career. Oh, I love it there. And the doctor at work and just that, that whole timing, and we're still in the whole, you know, carbon, putting a value on carbon, but I'm seeing a lot. We work with a lot of large real estate portfolios, for example, and it is happening finally. So tell us a little bit about that early career then. So, you know, going back, getting your advanced degrees, and then how'd you end up to at Georgia Tech? So my dissertation was on voluntary and mandatory information disclosures programs to address climate change. I was looking at it as one of the earlier people to look at the Carbon Disclosure Project, now called called the CDP. And shortly after arriving at Georgia Tech, which is my first sort of real job after graduate school, I did work in research in between undergrad and graduate school. But this is my first real job after graduate school as an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. I I met someone who became my co-author, and we were really interested in the LEED eco-label. And specifically, we were really interested in how it provides this, you know, continuous score with a discontinuous, what an economist would call a signal. So this discontinuous marketing signal, so certified silver, gold, platinum, that and what our first paper in this space proved that that discontinuous signal provided additionality. It provided it caused builders or developers or whoever builds buildings to become greener and to invest more resources in advanced energy and environmental technologies. That paper came out in 2014. And that paper really launched this sort of career for like the last eight years of research that culminated in a book that we just published called Eco Labels, Innovation and Green Market Transformation, colon, Learning to Lead, where we turn that story into a more dynamic process where you have early movers into the lead eco label and they produce positive information spillovers that help change the market. Man, that's fantastic. So it's safe to say you've been working on this for a little while. We're going to talk about the book 
in a minute. And, you know, but I love to still keep looking back on this yeah. career so far, just, man, mentors. Was there anyone that either opened a door for you or maybe you looked up to with some of the work they were doing? I've had so many great mentors in my career. I'm going to just call out two of them. One was my PhD advisor, Evan Rinquist. He If it were easy, somebody else would have already done. And he was just a great mentor, a great teacher. He pushed people really hard, even if they resented him for it. And he, you know, appreciated being resented for pushing people hard and really has been a role model for me. He was also a great parent and he died really young of cancer. And it was just heartbreaking. And the other person I'll call out is Eleanor Ostrom, who is also on my dissertation committee. And she eventually won the Nobel Prize in economics. She actually missed my dissertation defense because she was getting the Nobel Prize, you know, it's an excused absence. And she really encouraged me to I think about the structure of institutions. And we would call, you know, an eco label like lead, maybe a green club as a style of institution that encourages people to provide public goods. Uh, and some of her other students, Sim Prakash. Matt Potowski wrote a book on green clubs talking about how these clubs encourage people to provide public goods in exchange for an excludable marketing benefit. And that, you know, has helped shape how I think about LEAD and how I think about voluntary environmental programs. Those are rock star mentors. Thanks for giving them a shout out. And so, you know, we're connecting some dots here that career. I still want to give you permission to look back once more. Hey, what are some kind of proud accomplishments when you look back. So so aside from writing writing the book, I'm going to say, you know, mentoring my PhD students. I've graduated, I don't know, half a dozen PhD students over the last few years and one of whom won a couple of dissertation awards, so that's supremely gratifying. And also when I have students that come back and talk to me about all of their great achievements and all the great things they're doing, makes me really happy. And the one from outside of work that I'll call out is I qualified for the Boston Marathon, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. And I did it again this past year. And so that that was kind of fun getting back into running, something I took up during the pandemic again. And having some success at that after working hard is really gratifying. Man, congratulations. That's really cool. So let's talk about the book you wrote. And, and then I want to get a peek into kind of academia today because I, I graduated from Georgia Tech 18 years ago. So I'm not sure what it's like today. And are students really into this and sustainability or do you have to teach them? But tell us about your book. I mean, clearly it's one of your proudest accomplishments here. And I've been working on it a while. And, um, you know, tell us how that came together and what it means to you and what someone could expect. And we'll put a link to your book for sure. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the general premise of the book is looking at, in a dynamic sense, how early movers into eco-label programs provide uh, positive information externalities to others in the market. And so, you know, this all started in, you know, with the first publication in 2014, where we looked at the impact of the lead eco-label and encouraging additionality that is more investment in energy and environmental technology than would happen otherwise. We've had, I don't know, six or seven other papers in this space where we describe the economics of eco-labels and of lead and how these work and these eco-labels work by certifying hard-to-observe characteristics of a building, right? So you have a building... And you don't really, it's really hard to tell how energy efficient it is by looking at it, right? Or, you know, what the indoor air quality is going to be. So when you certify lead, you're certifying hard to observe improvements. And that then confers value in the marketplace. And you see that with higher resale values, with higher occupancy rates, with a whole host, you know, a greater employee productivity. And so all these sort of benefits that are conferred by the traits that underlie the lead eco-label, but the eco-label itself is the certification of these traits and making them easy to observe to individuals. As some of the other papers we've looked at, the lead pilot and demonstration uh, project program. And one of the things we found was that if you put a lead pilot project in a particular geographic location, which we measure as a zip code, either three-digit or five-digit, uh, we see basically double the probability that somebody else is going to build a lead building in that zip code afterwards. And uh, we find shorter construction times, for example, in those zip codes 
if there was a lead pilot project built in that zip code. And we find that organizations that build a lead pilot project are more likely to build more lead projects. So all of these findings, we were able to sort of wrap up. And, you know, if you read the journal articles, good luck. I mean, there's a lot of econometrics. It's a lot of math. It's not a fun read at all. And so the goal was to take all this research that we had really produced for economists and for, you know, a real academic audience and to translate this into more of a story that somebody in the green building world might appreciate and to translate some of these kind of challenging economic concepts and challenging statistical findings into a more digestible form that will help people in the green building movement understand what it is they're doing, what it is they've accomplished, how you know the economics of the label works to confer value to customers, to confer value to society. Man, that's some important research. I've been working in LEED for 14, 15 years, and it's exciting that you've pulled this together. And I'm sure there's a lot that would like to dig into that more. I didn't realize some of those stats. So thanks for sharing just a peek. Uh, to all of our listeners, we will put a link to Dan's book and uh, you got to check it out. So I'm sure some of this makes its way into your syllabus, maybe in some of these semesters, maybe not. So give us a peek into what's it like going to college these days and maybe some of these advanced degree programs, um, you know, students come and asking for this. They kind of have a little, are they a little more in the know? They don't say leads. They say lead. I don't know. How is it right now, Dan? So certainly I think the lead eco label in the United States is widely recognized. Although it's funny, the publisher of the book is Cambridge University Press, which is in England. And when I said learning to lead, which is what oh. I wanted the title of the book to be learning to lead. Yeah. And they vetoed it. They didn't know what the lead label was because, you know, Bream is more popular in England. We do cover Bream as well in the book, but most of our data is lead lead oriented. And any, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about, so I started a new master's program at Georgia Tech specifically because we saw a rising demand for sustainability professionals. And so the degree is called a Master in Sustainable Energy and Environmental Management. And basically the way it's structured, it's a one-year, 12-month program where you take a course called Sustainable Energy and Environmental Management, where we cover, you know, what is sustainability? What does that mean? Where did this concept come from? How do we measure it? What sorts of tools do we have to implement it? And then we get into case studies and we talk, we bring in a lot of businesses and we brought in that the city of Atlanta was here with us on Tuesday talking about all the stuff that's going on in the corporate world, in the NGO world, in the government world around sustainability and a lot of sustainability metrics. So, you know, life cycle analyses and assessments and GRI reporting and CDP reporting and all the stuff that's going on in that space gets covered in that class. Then students will take environmental economics and they get to take a bunch of different to fit their interests. And so you might take a class in life cycle assessment or you might take a class in GIS. And so this degree is, I think we're in our fourth year right now and it's growing rapidly. And so that's been certainly really exciting. I also teach undergrads and PhD students, and I teach, you know, an energy policy and markets class. That's always really popular, especially with people who are thinking about going into the energy industry. Uh, but yeah, we have been placing people at companies like JIL and commercial real estate companies and in consulting companies that work in real estate and in development. So this is clearly a growth area and it's been really exciting to, to be a part of that. Oh man, doing your part, putting these great candidates out there and hopefully they're maybe even taking a lead exam as they enter the workforce. I can help them with that. Okay. So a lot you just covered there. Anything else that just is kind of keeping you busy today? What's a peek into your world? Uh, well, I was just asked to be the faculty lead on Georgia Tech's climate action plan. So we'll be working with some consultants and with the sort of facilities and operations side of the university. And I think my task is to engage faculty and students. And so that's pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to getting into that, to being able to put into practice some of the stuff that I teach in the classroom. So, so that's exciting. I've started working on my next book, which will be about market transformation in the beer space, craft beer space, okay. and looking at how public policy and sustainability intersect with craft beer. So that's kind of a fun, fun little project that I've wanted to do for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's some... Lead Platinum breweries out there, New Belgium, for example, and probably many others. And that'll be a that'll be a fun read. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed is there's a lot of breweries that have, and I can't even 
I'm still trying to understand this space a little bit, but I see you know a whole bunch of labels on the back of cans like solar powered brewery, and yet I can't actually find or figure out if that's some official designation, if it's certified or who produces that label. But definitely there's a proliferation of eco labeling in the brewery space as well. Wow, that's a good point. All right, well, you'll sort through it. So, okay, let's take a look just to kind of, you know, get to know you a little more, but also kind of look to the future. So I really like to just ask this question, you know, where do you think sustainability and green buildings are maybe going to be shifting? Like, what do you like to read up on that's maybe coming at us? So certainly, and I was part of the Drawdown Georgia initiative, which was a techno-economic plan modeling effort to understand climate change options in Georgia. And one of the things that became quite clear to me is a number of emergent technologies like mass timber, alternative cement, building retrofitting. Uh, The other big area that I think is emergent that came mostly from discussions with people in this space is this intersection between data analytics, machine learning, AI, and the built environment, and specifically how we might think about the integration of our buildings with thermal energy management, with electric grid resilience, with the storage of energy produced by renewables, and how do we think about providing a grid and built environment that's that's cleaner and greener and more resilient and more robust and more efficient. And I think that the intersection of the buildings and the grid and demand side management and how we use data analytics to do all this is going to be really emergent over the next decade or so. Yeah, zooming it out, getting ready for these renewables, all things good management. I mean, I agree with all this. So let's get to know you a little bit more here. Uh, Maybe a few rapid fire questions. Uh, Dan, what would you say is your specialty or gift? I think I'm pretty good at connecting concepts that we might be interested in measuring or capturing from, you know, a more theoretical lens with specific ways to measure them. And, you know, for example, you know, and my co-author Doug Noonan played an equal or even greater role in this, but looking at the distribution of buildings in the lead eco label to understand how those, you know, tiers, the silver, gold, and platinum tiers caused additionality into that space. Or, you know, the inspiration for the for the book on market transformation was, you know, we built this living building at Georgia Tech, the Candida building, great building. I highly recommend people come and take a tour. But when they built the building, they said, you know, We wanted to build a building that lives, learns, and teaches, and a building that transforms the building and construction industry in the Southeast. And I said, well, that's a testable hypothesis. And went out and, you know, dug around the data and found, you know, that there's these lead pilot projects. And we actually have 25 years of experience building lead pilot projects. And so how do we then take that information and weave it into a quantitative story that helps us measure the causal effects of the green building movement. That's good stuff, man. Oh, thank you. Do you have any good habits or routines you could share? Well, I'd say balance overall, right? I I run a lot. I try to run about five, six times a week. I work hard. I play hard. Uh, I like to go to music festivals and concerts. And I really think that it's important to step away from work and that the quality, now I'm an economist, so I believe in diminishing marginal returns, right? So with each aspect of your life, you know, if you each hour you work, you probably have diminishing marginal returns. And each hour you maybe play, you have diminishing marginal returns. And so if I'm trying to optimize my life, I'm thinking about where I might, you know, spend enough time doing all these different things to get the most out of, to, to get the most out of life. I like that. Thank you. I'm a fan of a bucket list. Could you give us a peek? Is there, are there one or two things maybe on your bucket list you could share? I'd love to climb Kilimanjaro. I don't know. I'd like to get to Alaska. I think that might be my last state to get to. There's probably a few other places in the world I'd really like to go as well. But really, you know, I think I've done a really good job enjoying life so far and being productive and like to just keep doing everything I've been doing for as long as I can keep doing it. 
Yeah, you got a good outlook, man. That, that's a big one on the bucket list. Uh, just a few more questions here, Dan. I'm enjoying getting to know you more. You know, is there a book? We've mentioned your book. We're going to link to it, but a book or a podcast or a TED Talk or a documentary. Just, you know, is there something you'd recommend to our listeners they should they should get a copy of? So, so another book that's on a similar, I don't know, vibe is mine, is a book called Gre- by Greg Nemet, who's an economist at, I think, University of Wisconsin. It's called How Solar Got Cheap. So that's a good one. That one really talks about the role of early stage R&D and building economies of scale and incentives and driving the solar industry. So that's a good one. I really like the Planet Money podcast on NPR. It's probably the only one I listen to religiously, but that, that's a really good one. And I actually end up pulling a number of clips from that one for my sustainable energy and environmental management class. Oh, man, that's really neat. Okay, we'll put some links to those that you recommended here. So let's say you're looking back on your career so far. Is there anything you wish you'd have known earlier? Well, I think I got really great advice throughout my career. I do think, especially early on, you know, before grad school, that I I wish I had made better connections with mentors early, like an undergrad, go to office hours, get to know your professors. I really didn't do that. And, you know, looking back on it, wish I had. I wish I had studied a little more math and statistics and probability and methods more. I wish I had become a better programmer. And so all of those, especially for people still in college or maybe thinking about going to graduate school, those are all things that you can take advantage of and advice that I give my current students. That is good advice, man. Cool. Thank you. All right. Last question. Let's say someone's listening to this podcast and they're just now jumping into the green building movement. Any words of encouragement for them? I think that this space, this green building, I mean, LEED has been at this for 25, 30 years now, but it's really gaining momentum. It's gaining mainstream acceptance and it's becoming part of the mainstream. I, you know, when I started in this space 20 years ago, there were no corporate sustainability jobs or sustainability offices. And now, you know, they're small, but every organization has a sustainability office. And I think that trend, and this is going to be routinized and ubiquitous, not just in sustainability offices, but in all of the facets of the operations of business, of government, of other organizations. And I think that's really exciting. So I think this is a great time to jump into the movement. And and there's a lot of momentum there. Solid advice. Good nuggets in there. Listeners. Connect with Dan on LinkedIn, check out what Georgia Tech's up to, and check out Dan's book. I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us, Dan. That's really, really enjoyed our conversation today. Yeah, I really did as well, Charlie. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you to our loyal listeners. We actually are celebrating over one year here on the Green Building Matters podcast. Me and the entire team were stoked and just so glad you continue to listen every Wednesday morning to a new interview with a green building professional here in this industry, or just some pro tips that we want to make sure that you are getting straight from us, straight to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues. And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.